Okay, so uh, today uh, it is the birthday of Carlos Carpa. If he would have lived, he would have been 115 years old today. So, the, as I said, this is a text um, I wrote uh, in you know, almost 30 years ago um, in New York after attending a conference by Kenneth Frampton on Carlos Carpa. And I called it uh, temporarily, but as someone said, uh, nothing is as permanent as what is temporary, uh, the detail which knows. And I'm still not quite sure that this title is the best, but uh, I, I had no time to, to correct it, uh, or I didn't make time to correct it. And there are a few other things in the text which uh, do not receive my total uh, uh, you know, positive assessment. Uh, so I ask for forgiveness. But I think there are uh, certain uh, thoughts here that, that perhaps are worth uh, contemplating and discussing about. And I would be very happy if you have something to say about what I'm going to read. So I begin. What Scarpa teaches us, besides other things, is that the infinite is here in our closest proximity. The nearness of things is nearer than we think. And if longing is the agony of the nearness of what lies afar, as Heidegger said, then by the same token, nearness could be the quiet exaltation of that which, being distant, lies in fact in our closest vicinity. I wrote somewhere else that the infinite is here in the space between two bricks. What does this mean? It means once that verum ipsum factum, that cosmic knowledge could be obtained by the simple act of placing a brick above another brick with care. But in that join, that intermediate place, space, between one unit and the other lies an ocean of ontology. If you do not know how to translate from one brick to the other, you do not know how to translate from the square to the circle, or in even more general terms, from the terrestrial to the celestial. The work of Carlos Carpa is an immeasurable series of small but infinitely tender embraces. The gentle embrace between one brick and the other, between one circle and the other, between the column and the ceiling, between the column and the floor, between the present and what might follow. His enormous desire to remain within tradition, as Kenneth Frampton said, equates an enormous desire to continue. If there is anything which allows Samuel Beckett to continue in his famous, I can't go on, I will go on, is exactly this, tradition. The mother who hates seeing her child go, but who nevertheless made him. This is tradition. You cannot go without it because you cannot be without it. Without probably knowing it, the Romanian critic Andrei Pleșu described what tradition is in the very same way Louis Kahn described what order is. Order is, said Kahn. Tradition is, said Pleshu. Do we have to walk on our tiptoes in a space conceived by Scarpa? Probably yes. If, you, if we do not want to disturb the gentle deities who preside motherly over it. Yes, Scarpa still believes in the place. But place for him is not that exasperated nowhere of our modern facile formal inventions. It has to do more with the unseen than with the seen. I am very sure you might very well, busy as you are, pass by or through a Scarpa building without noticing it at the first glance. But if you look more carefully, you discover the infinite gentleness of a detail which knows. Knows what, you might ask? It knows that, as Lao Tse said, the way to do is to be. It is here in doing by being and being by doing that Scarpa constructs and construes that he unites the techne of logos with the logos of techne and the gener generous dictum ad verum ipsum factum. The detail knows the power of water. Can we talk about Scarpa without talking about water? Again, we come back to Lao Tse, a normal man, if there ever was one, as Emil Choran called him. Says Lao Tse, as the soft yield of water cleaves the obstinate stone, so to yield with life, 
solves the insoluble. To yield, I have learned, is to come back again. To come back again, is this not the lesson of water? Is this not the lesson of Carlos Carpa, of his built architecture and his drone architecture? He came back in his drawings, one after the other, one above the other, one under the other, one near the other, one together with the other, one yielding to and forcing the other, exactly like water, fighting through yet caressing stone. Didn't Kenneth Frampton say that this man, so much concerned with the ethics of construction, was actually a very sensual man? But is it not through its ineffable sensuality that water cuts stone? But it cuts it in order to embrace it somewhere else. What is more fluid, more yielding than water? Asked Lao Tse. Yet back it comes again, wearing down the rigid strength which cannot yield to withstand it. As the true hermetic, Scarpa burns with water. Here it is his power. He who bites the dust is owner of the earth. He who is scapegoat is king, says again Lao Tse. And yet in another place, he says, there is no need to run outside for better seeing, nor to peer from a window, rather abide at the center of your being. For the more you leave it, the less you learn. Yes, this is the lesson Scarpa teaches us. Be at the center of your being. Make room for space there. There is infinite space here, everywhere, in as much as there is infinite time, now, every time. Wasn't there this Chinese saying, in a moment there are thousands of years? Symmetrically, we could say that in a square inch, there are many square miles. We must remember this or relearn it. There is no need to run outside, says Lao Tse. So it is that, uh, that, 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 that the strong are overcome by the weak, the hearty by the humble, Lao Tse again. Yes, the humbleness of water again, this is the weakness we need the power of. And this so-called weakness could enable us to re-anthropologize technology, remembering with Heidegger that it is not just a means towards an end, but a human activity as well. This is why, if it is true that today, as Bernard Chumi wrote, the technology of construction is less relevant than the construction of technology, we should build in such a way that, that they would become equally relevant. This is what Scarpa teaches us. He is able, so to speak, to incorporate the hammer into the nail and the nail into the hammer. The hammering of the nail is equally relevant as the hammer and the nail themselves. This is what Lao Tzu said. The way to do is to be. You must be the hammer, the nail, and the one who uses them at once, including the one who thinks about them and draws them. Think about that column which suffers when it has become round from the squareness of its base. And think about that the suffering of the same column when it reaches towards a heaven, heaven, heaviness which simply is not there. Could there be anything more tragic than a column which grows to support nothing? That is why Scarpa interrupts the nothingness of the hanged ceiling above the column. It honors it. It moves towards it with a heavy slab. He knows that the column longs for its heaviness, which is nothing more, nothing less than its raison d'etre. There is so much suffering today in a column. It cannot grow easily from the earth, and it has with great difficulty something to long for upwards. And Scarpa expresses the suffering of the column born halfway without a reason to be and halfway without a reason to die. I call this the agony of the column. There are other agonies in Scarpa's work too, like the agony between admitting and demitting, all culminating in a new ornament and thus contradicting Adolf Loss that no new ornament is possible. I see the work of Scarpa as a series of approximations, of workings and reworkings, of postponements, of comings back, like water, eroding and adding at the same time. In fact, we might call, in fact, 
uh, sorry for the misspelling, we might call his holistic fragments positive erosions. Again, he burns with water. He builds through erosion. He is enchanting because he builds. His disenchantment derives from erosion. If he is of interest today, it is at a time of deconstruction, it might be because of this, that there is a fractal geometry in his work that might appear deconstruction, but only superficially so, because always his fragments reclaim themselves from a center. It is that center Lao Tse wrote about, rather when he said, rather abide at the center of your being. There could be greatness in the humble, and this is what Scarpa, Scarpa teaches us. He knows, as Rainer Maria Rilke, that we should never tire of trying to unite the male with the female. And this is what he does with his pairs of columns, with the inverted minuscule ziggurats playing hide and seek with each other. And the many hesitations of water are not at all lack of purpose. But the purpose is its own immediacy, it's in its own journey, in as much as the target, the sea itself. And being about water, his work is about time. Time flows as water flows, as space flows too. But in his case, space does not flow as in, as in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright. There is a circular movement, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there is a circular movement rather than expansionist. It is the space and time of the Uroboros, see Carl Jung, the eternal recurrence of the same, the cyclical time of Vico, uh, Jam, Nietzsche and Heidegger. Here it is a different kind of Zarathustra, a different kind of hero. It is the hero who burns with water, not with fire. It is the hero who yields. Do we need another planet to be like Scarpa? No, ours is large enough. In fact, our own room is large enough to be able to do this. In fact, a square inch is large enough for Scarpa, and for us it could be so too, hopefully. Unless we love, adore each square inch of our world, we cannot build like him. The detail, said Khan, writing about Scarpa, is the adoration of nature. And the adoration of nature is in fact the adoration of God and Theos Firma. Now here I, uh, I ended polemically towards uh, Peter Eisenman because he transformed Entera Firma into Enteror Firma. So I played uh, with the words myself and I ended by saying Entheos Firma, which you, I am sure you understand what it means. Okay, so now uh, I, I'll begin the, the presentation, the power presentation, uh, which I prepared for today. Carlos Carpa, 1906-1978. Uh, these three words in Latin, which I mentioned in the, in the, in the text I just read, are inscribed on the, the entrance door to the uh, campus of the, um, the architecture uh, university in, in Venice, where he was uh, a professor, but a professor of interior uh, architecture and uh, uh, you know, drawing and uh, decoration, as I read, because he was not, he was, cons he was called a professor and not an architect because he didn't have that uh, uh, document that I mentioned, you know, so all his life he was considered a, a professor and not an architect because he didn't have that, uh, that paper, which was given to him after his death. So the, the, the Institute of Urbanism, uh, I don't know exactly what those four letters, but is the University of Architecture in Venice. And I understood is the only university of architecture in Italy is the one in Venice. And he designed the entrance into this, uh, uh, into the small campus. And uh, on the, on, in, in concrete, it is uh, incised verum ipsum factum. In fact, you can see it here you know, verum ipsum factum. Uh, and uh, the, the, the entrance is quite, uh, is quite uh, impressive. Uh, it is dramatic, it is simple, 
but it is a genuine uh, um, Carlos Scarpa work. You know, you have, uh, you know, uh, sophistication here and uh, technology is present, metal is present, but uh, all in all, the, the, the feeling is of a, of a, of a, of a uh, you know, architectural entity which is not dominated by uh, the logos of Techna. So here it is, the interest into the campus. I call it campus. It is a campus, but it's not very large. And it couldn't be very large within the city of Venice, of course. Uh, it, it's atypical, no? It's, it, it doesn't look like a, you know, a typical gate. Uh, but then uh, we are dealing with an architect who himself was not typical. So there. Verum ipsum factum. A view from the inside. It's not far away from the from the train station. If the pandemic goes away and if you arrive uh, one day in Venice, you could visit it. But you have to know, you have to know that it's not far away. When I uh, emigrated from Romania, I landed in Venice, and it took me a number of hours to arrive at this uh, at this school. Uh, because nobody was able to explain to me uh, those I asked. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to give directions in Venice, which is a labyrinth, of course. And you just have to cross a bridge and you're almost in front of this uh, entrance door. And at that time, I didn't even know this was designed by Carlos Scarpa. They had some important uh, professors there, you know, like Aldo Rossi, Tafuri, Francesco Dalco, and others. So, Carlos Scarpa, born on the 2nd of June, 1906, exactly 115 years ago, was an Italian architect influenced by the materials, landscapes, landscape and the history of Venetian culture and by Japan. Scarpa translated his interest in history, regionalism, invention, and the techniques of the artist and craftsman into ingenious glass and furniture design. Unfortunately, in this presentation, I don't show um, glass and furniture design, but I'll show uh, uh, most of his buildings. Here is the man smoking. Not too many architects smoke today, but he was smoking at the time. And um, with an interesting profile, I would say. Uh, here he was, uh, you know, working on a piece of glass with a with a with a craftsman, as a young man. Uh, but you can you can tell even from this picture that he was an intense man, you know, possessed in a way by uh, by his quest. And he seems to have a cigarette on his left hand here too, if I see properly. Uh, working with the craftsmen together is, is a luxury. Today we don't have such a luxury. And, uh, but in, in, uh, in uh, Italy, I think it, uh, it was still possible. And maybe it still is. So this brilliant architect, as I said, was humiliated by, by uh, bureaucracy. He was unable to, you know, to, to sign his projects with his name because he didn't have the right to do so. And he was unable to teach architecture, although it's possible, um, you know, uh, although Italy had uh, other brilliant architects, but he was one of the most brilliant, if not the most brilliant. And, uh, you know, he had to associate himself with another architect who would sign uh, the papers, which he could, didn't have the legal right to sign. Uh, unfortunately, just like other architects, uh, uh, at times, towards the end of his life, he had, in my opinion, that strange taste for choosing the, 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 the glasses for his eyes. And you are going to see, in fact, it, it's here, but you can't see it very well. Um, here, you know, why is it that architects uh, have this uh, curious need to distinguish themselves with uh, awkward, uh, uh, you know, uh, eyeglasses, you know, 
I mean, even these are, are strange, you know, it wasn't just Le Corbusier, but in the case of Le Corbusier, maybe there was a reason here because he lost the sight in, in his right eye and he had to manufacture, I guess, special, um, I don't know, frames or, uh, but uh, <laughs> this is truly, uh, someone has to, 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 to write a paper or something about architects and the eyeglasses. Here he is in Japan, uh, dressed uh, like a Japanese man, and he seems to be at home here. Uh, the picture was taken in Japan, but uh, the man seemed to be, you know, born in Japan. Um, yes, the eternally seductive uh, and impressive Japan. Some drawings. He drew beautifully. I mean, if an architect drew beautifully, this was Scarpa. He was not the only one, of course, but uh, truly, if we look carefully at his drawings, we understand that he was a very sensitive man and with a very particular and almost peculiar attention to detail, to the most minute little thing. Um, I mean, really, if I compare, I, 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 yes, it's true, I am polemical towards B.R.K. Ingels and others like him, but we cannot compare the drawings of Carlos Scarpa with the drawings of B.R.K. Ingels. I am sorry, but the, the, the drawings of B.R.K. Ingels are, um, you know, cartoon-like by comparison. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. Here we are dealing with a, with a, with a, with a different kind of sensibility. You know, uh, this man didn't uh, draw cartoons. He was uh, deeply questing for uh, the lyricism of what he was working on. Uh, you know, th these drawings, just like the drawings of his friend Louis Kahn, are impressive artistically speaking. And what do we see here? It's 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 a uh, it's it's a. Uh, uh, you know, an incredible, uh, uh, I almost used an ignoble word, salad of, 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 of various uh, attempts at, at grasping a certain detail or something within the plan of the house he was building or he was working on. Very interesting drawings. And I understood this man had a, a religious, mystical reverence for pencils. He wouldn't use any pencil with any drawing. For a certain paper, he used certain pencils. And for another kind of paper, he, he would use different kinds of pencils. So he was a, a, a mystic, actually, and, uh, but also a sensualist in a way. He wanted the, the, that unique pencil most appropriate for a certain paper. And, uh, you know, uh, his drawings show this love for the drawing and the, the love of the process of discovery, which architecture is and perhaps should be. I mean, look, look here, you know, I mentioned in my text the two columns and look, look at, at, the, at, at the eventful meeting between the verticality of the columns and the horizontality of the beams. There is creation here, deep poetical creation. And architecture cannot be otherwise if it is to deserve its name. This is, uh, I think, upside down, uh, but uh, that's how I found it. We also see uh, uh, a man uh, with maybe, maybe with a certain amount of uh, angst in him. You know, these are not drawings of uh, someone uh, uh, with a placid disposition. No, I, I, I would say that, you know, these drawings show uh, uh, an inner turmoil. But this inner turmoil is not uh, aggressive. It's, I mean, it's some kind of a strange combination between gentleness and turmoil. It's a gentle turmoil, if I am to call it so. Yes, there are numbers here, of course, but the overall feeling is that which uh, uh, his friend Louis Kahn uh, uh, referred to when he said a great building is supposed to start 
with the immeasurable and then go through the measurable, meaning numbers and so on, dimensions, and then in the end come back into the immeasurable. And, you know, despite the fact that he has here words and numbers and so on, all in all, you can tell that this man was questing for the immeasurable. And that's why we talk about him today. <laughs> exactly, that's why. Look here, you know, uh, again, you know, is a man possessed by the, by what Louis, by, by what uh, Kenneth Frampton called the adoration of the joint. It's all about this really, you know, it, it's about uh, joining. And uh, I think Frampton used uh, the, the appropriate words, the adoration of the joint. Uh, Vincent Scully, the, the important historian and theoretician of architecture, who was also a friend of, uh, of Kahn, they both taught at Yale University. When he wrote about Louis Kahn, he had a, um, you know, a motto for his article that I read uh, that was written by a, a British uh, writer, uh, Forster, and there were just two words, only connect. Well, these two words say it all. It's the adoration of the joint. But the, the, the words adoration of the joint belong to Frampton. The, the words only connect were used by Vincent Scully to describe the very same thing. This is in a way the purpose of, of art. And I include architecture here too, to connect, to join. The opposites, yes, fire with water, the earth with the sky, the male with the female, nature and culture and so on. There are many pairs of opposites. Beautiful drawings. We saw this one already. I mean, you know, this, this, this drawing was supposed to be, right, a technical drawing. It, it looks like it, but he humanized it. He, he made it a plastic, uh, uh, you know, event in a way, because he brought beauty in. I understood the way he worked. He placed uh, yellow tracing paper above a yellow tracing paper, above yellow tracing paper. He was continuously questing. This is a fragment from, uh, you know, for the Brion Cemetery. I remember I discovered Carlos Scarpa many years ago, looking through a magazine, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, where I saw these amazing drawings, you know, so precise and at the same time so free and mysterious. Um, truly, the drawings of Carlos Scarpa are uh, uh, events in themselves. They are never dry. Even the humblest uh, sketch, it's, it is charged lyrically. He was a poet, to put it simply. And as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said, a great architect is supposed to be a great poet. Not necessarily writing poems with words, no. The, the architect writes poems with matter, no, with uh, wood, uh, brick, uh, iron, steel, uh, cement, uh, whatever the material, glass. But in essence, is about being a poet. In other words, uh, aspiring, longing for the immeasurable. Now, we, uh, we start the trip uh, uh, through his architecture uh, with uh, some of his um, lesser known works, uh, his residences, meaning houses. Sometimes he only worked within, you know, an apartment, uh, the interior, but uh, always the personality of Carlos Scarpa is present. This Casa Veriti from Udine, Udine 1955-1961. Uh, 
So, you know, it took him some, some time. I mean, he was born in 1906. So he was already uh, 49 years old when he built this. Uh, and I think I have it uh, in another part uh, by, by mistake, actually, I, I, uh, I show it twice if I'm not wrong. It's an interesting house, really. It's, um, it's, it's, it has a level of complexity and uh, it is surprising, you know, it, 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 you wouldn't really see here too much tradition, so to speak, but uh, maybe uh, seen from uh, different angles shows that the Scarpa didn't want to divorce himself completely from what we call the past. But, but uh, um, you know, I would say that at least uh, from some uh, points of view, the building is, uh, um, you know, quite innovative and, and courageous, I would say. But you see here on the right, he never gave up on ornament. He never renounced ornament. And uh, this uh, says a lot about him. And he was not a modernist who would banish ornament just to concentrate on structure. No. And you see it here, you know, with some influences maybe, you know, from Frank Lloyd Wright perhaps, or, uh, uh, you know, also his manipulation of glass is different from most modernists. You know, there is a sense of uh, a different sensibility here. I mean, uh, you know, uh, this, this modernism is, is, is kind, is not harsh. Look, look, look at this corner here, you know, it's very sensitively done. And water again, you know, he, he, water is continuously in the proximity of his buildings. I imagine in his collaborations with those architects who signed the project, uh, he was the, the, the creative force. But sometimes it's a little bit difficult to, 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 to know what was the actual, actual role of, of the other architect. Uh, very often his works appear, uh, um, you know, with a, a few names, at least one other name. Villa Zopas, 1957 in Treviso. Uh, for this one, I couldn't find pictures. I only found this drawing. Um, and we saw a yellow tracing uh, paper sketch, a sketch done on a yellow tracing paper with these, uh, you know, cylinders. Uh, previously, I don't have, maybe it was not built. I couldn't find pictures, photographs of this building. Casa Veriti, which I already we, we already saw, but here we we see the plan and a few other images. Um, this plan was not drawn by him or his associate; was drawn later, maybe by some student or you know. I mean, his work is uh, of course the subject of research uh, in many schools of architecture and by many people. Although he has the status. Uh, of, um, uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, underappreciated architect. I, I met these words in, in some uh, articles. I, I think he is known, he is known, and he's, he was definitely a force in, uh, in the architecture of the world uh, at that time. But um, because of his, uh, uh, you know, even the nature of his work, he's, he's he is a little bit difficult in a way, you know, because uh, it's not easy to grasp, you know, unless you have a, a, a you know, a, a certain disposition, especially uh, uh, emotionally, to to uh, vibrate to his work. And maybe this very uh, ambivalence caused by, by the fact that on one hand he was a modernist and on the other hand, if Frampton was right, that he made efforts 
not to uh, not to uh, banish tradition and from this very fact derive uh, certain uh, complexities and difficulties but I, I i admire his work exactly because he assumed uh, looking both ways forward and backwards And I also think the fact that he was teaching interior architecture and drawing and what is called decoration, his work is imbued with a, with a sense of interiority, even when he works, of course, outside. Uh, so the so-called exterior architecture in his case has an intimacy which derives perhaps from his, um, you know, uh, his teaching. He brought to the to the uh, what might be called uh, perhaps not quite appropriately exterior architecture, as in opposition to interior architecture. He brought something of the kindness, the interiority, the warmth, the gentleness of the interior outside, and I think this is a quality. I mean, look at this. You know, this is this modern. It is, but uh, there is a but. Look at this corner. Look at the frames of the windows. You know, uh, I mean, in my opinion, it's beautiful what he did here. You know, he, he didn't use the dogma of modernism, the one advocated, for example, by Le Corbusier in Villa Savoie. No, this is, a, this is a, an architecture which uh, is less... Uh, harshly disposed towards what uh, preceded him. A good building, a very good building. Although there are, uh, you know, innovations, so to speak, look what is going on here, you know, and there are these narrow spaces and looking up and looking down and so, you know, this is not a traditional, traditional and traditionalist house by any means. Now, another house, uh, Casa Balboni in Venezia, in Venice, 1964-1974. So it took uh, 10 years to build. This was uh, in front of an existing uh, bigger building. I don't understand I, what exactly he did here, but I love this, um, you know, first contact with the house. Uh, you know, it's maybe in, a, I don't know, in a courtyard or is it a, rather hidden? And I imagine because it's a, it's a large apartment that, that uh, goes deep into the building behind but he also built this, you know, and it's it's so sensitive and, and you know, I mean, it's a small entrance, it's not an unassuming entrance, but I think it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful, beautifully done, you know, it's, it, there is a, a, an aristocratic modesty, if I am to call it so here. Uh, the house, as you can tell, uh, this is not uh, the house for anybody. It's not the house for a proletarian, but uh, uh, you, you can tell that, you know, as opposed to many of the presentations I, I make, which are many of them are about modernist uh, architects, many, many from the United States and so on. Here there is a, a sense of culture, of history, of uh, even when there is modernity, like here, clean, shining, uh, slick surfaces, there is, a, there is something here, you know, a subtleness, which has to do with the subtleness of Venice. He was born in Venice. Then he moved to Vicenza with his family. His mother died when he was 13. Then with his uh, brother and his father, they returned to Venice. So there, you know, this was a man, a sensitive young man who was uh, immersed in the, in the aristocratic, uh, sophisticated spirit of Venice. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it shows even in this, uh, I would say, uh, more explicitly modernistic interiors.
I mean, look at this, you know, what is the function of this? If we are to talk in functionalist terms, you know, it's, it's a capricious, uh, uh, you know, uh, fragment of the house. But I, I, I would say that the, the capriciousness of what we see uh, lies, uh, lies beauty. Not everything needs to be explained uh, rationally or in terms of a uh, banal uh, functionalism. No. There is culture here. There, are, there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the beauty of, of the passage of time. Look at the furniture. Look at everything, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yes, the kitchen is a modernistic kitchen. Maybe the floor is a little bit uh, trying to say, uh, you know, something a little bit different, but uh, it was probably, I don't know if this is what he did. It's possible in time this was uh, modified because people are obsessed by uh, kitchens. Uh, but look here, this is a, uh, this is a genuine, um, uh, you know, Carlos Carpa. I mean, you know, I can write a poem just by looking at this detail here. And you see the beauty, the adoration of the joint. You know, he could have gone straight into the horizontal parts with the vertical part and that's it. No, there is a symphonic work here or at least a sonata. You know, this is the beauty of architecture. You see, it's all about joining. Uh, and uh, th th there is a miracle here in a way, you know, it's, uh, I love this, you know, I and mean, then this is, this is Carlos Carpa at his best in small things like this, he says a lot. He says a lot because it is indeed about connecting and about joining, but discreetly, not harshly, not not through the violence that, for example, uh, Peter Zumthor used to, uh, towards those rocks, which I couldn't believe when I saw it, when he pierced the rocks with huge, uh, you know, uh, nails in order to, uh, you know, uh, erect his uh, structure on top of those rocks. No, Khan, I mean, Khan also, but uh, Scarpa would, would have never done something like this. No, no, there is brutality in, uh, I'm very sorry to say it, but you cannot compare Scarpa with Sumtor. Scarpa uh, was a much more sophisticated and gentle spirit. But we are unfortunately in a hurry, so uh, we build as we build. Uh, another house, this one in Rome, um, another spacious house. Uh, in, in Rome, uh, so this um, Venetian architect uh, was also invited to build in, in Rome. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, all the pictures I, I discovered have, uh, well, some of them have this, uh, you know, ownership, uh, you know, uh, uh, stamp or how to call it. Uh, anyway, uh, look, you know, uh, art, I mean, talking about joining, right? Talking about connecting, here they are. I mean, he, he didn't, I, he probably didn't even choose this artwork to be in the garden of this house. The choice probably belonged to the owner of the house. But in essence, his architecture is about this joining, you know, it's about love. Let's not avoid the world any longer. It's about love. Yes, the love between a column and a beam. Here, the, the love between two human beings. And it's a beautiful sculpture. And, uh, you know, if this doesn't inspire us, I don't know what could. And look at this stair, you know, this, uh, there are just a few steps, but it's an event architecturally. It's not, a, you know, it's, it's not indifferently done. You know, like, again, I feel like being polemical against poor uh, Peter Sumtor, but the interest into that chapel that is so celebrated is so banal compared to this interest into this building. And it might not even be the, the main interest, but this is architecturally sensitive. It's complex. It's, 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 uh, it is simple, but it is also complex. It's, you can tell it was designed with, uh, with sensitivity.
So this is in Rome, but most of his work is in the northern part of Italy, northeast, that is in Veneto. Casa Bellotto, 1944-1956, um, you know, why, why would it take so long, you know, I mean, we don't know, but the house incorporated the passage of time and everything is studied, you know, everything, you know, it's, at first you might say, what's so special about this house? Well, you know, uh, it's it's the it's the the, the detail which which uh, which generates interest. I would call Carlos Scarpa now as the uh, the Bonar of architecture, the great uh, French painter who was an intimist a beautiful, beautiful painter. There are very few architects like this, really. Because uh, the truth is, uh, on much of modern architecture, uh, the interior uh, is, uh, well, a lot of it is done by uh, decorators, interior designers, interior architects. And, uh, but I think uh, a good architect who, who, who is concerned about the wholeness of his or her building does both. And in the case of, of, of Scarpa, even more so, the interior is very, very important. In fact, here he did just the interior. Unfortunately, I couldn't find pictures with his house, Casa Carlos Scarpa. So for the moment, we have to just know that he built a house for himself, but I couldn't find it. That another one, which I also think I couldn't find. Well, no, this one I did find. And this one is interesting because it's so, in a way, uh, um, puzzling, you know? It, it, it's a building which, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's proclaiming uh, a difficult status. You look at the building on the right and you look at the, this building and you say, so what's so special about this building? But it has uh, uh, certain inventions, you know, like like this corner here, or the the oblongs here, uh, or the way uh, you know this the canopy of the roof is supported, you know, a little bit asymmetrically, and so there are small inventions, you know, who do something like this, you know? I, I mean, really, what modern architect would do something like this? And, and, and they can be used, they, they can, uh, they act as oblongs, but they also act ornamentally. So, you know, there, there is here a, a level of invention in small things. And uh, behind, uh, you know, here you have other surprises. Look at this. You know, uh, it's interesting, no? It's, it surprises you. Uh, look also this corner here, you know. Uh, so he was very, very careful about many, many little things. A house and the studio. Uh, here again, uh, it's this feeling of, of, of uh, uh, you know, he didn't just uh, design the interior of a house. I think he was uh, not demagogically interested in, uh, in, in, in creating an interior which was a home. So more than just a house. 
Uh, yes, the Rahi has some well-known pieces of furniture, modernistic as they are, but I don't know if they, the choice was his or uh, the owner's. Another house and studio. Um, look at this stair, you know, it's, it's very interesting, you know, the way he, uh, you know, is this uh, alternation between uh, working for the left leg and the right leg and the left leg and the right leg. And it's very abrupt, the stair, but it's pleasing visually. And I think it functions very well. Look at this. An invention, and he did. Uh, he did uh, use this kind of, uh, uh, you know, narrow uh, stairs uh, with uh, with with a different perception about what a stair should be or could be. Very interesting. I think this is the house of a lawyer, and uh, you know. Another house, 1963, the Casa Zentner uh, in Zurich this time. Uh, modernistic, but not harshly so. So there is cubism here, it's true, but it's not a harsh cubism. It's a, it's a, it's an, a approximation of Cubis. Again, perhaps because of his attempt to connect with what preceded him, that is with tradition or history or yeah, the, the previous, the previousness of, uh, of, uh, of the context in which he, uh, he built. I don't know about this. Uh, <laughs> You know, this curve thing here seems to be a little bit, um, for my taste, a little bit, um, you know, forced, but uh, who knows, maybe in reality being there is not like this. But looking at the building now, you know, after, you know, more than half a century later, uh, the building is still, uh, you know, has uh, dignity and beauty. Uh, this man, he worked a lot with this man, Angelo Massieri, and it was difficult for me sometimes to, to decide this, this house was built by him or by Angelo Massieri, or Angelo was just the one who signed the drawings that he did, Carlos Carpa, they worked on, on several projects together. Uh, this is a larger house, uh, and... Um, you see, he is also not afraid to keep uh, old walls alive, and uh, it, it, he's trying to negotiate with uh, with the history of the place. Casa Giacomuzzi, uh, again, the same kind of architecture, which is uh, uh, not dogmatic, which values fragments and uh, has cubistic elements, but uh, lyrically disposed. Look at this stair. Uh, by the way, this is you see is from Off Houses is a is a beautiful uh, uh, website uh, uh, whose author is Romanian. Um, uh, he has an exquisite uh, choice of pictures that he presents in his website. Um, it's called offhouses.com, and I love this uh, this uh, you know stare. This it's it's. It's a creation in itself. So yes, there is capriciousness here in, in the sense that there is invention. No, uh, where is the handrail? Where is the, I mean, why is it done this way and not the other way or whatever? Well, you know, not everything can be explained rationally or objectively in architecture. That's why architecture is an art. You know, you wouldn't ask a painter, why did you use the, the red here and green there and why this shape? And, you know, let the artist decide, let the architect decide. Another house, uh, Otolenghi, in collaboration, you see, with a few other people in Verona, 1974, 1979, it was finalized, before after his death, 
let's not forget, he died in 1978. It's a very nice house, a very interesting house uh, and surprising. It's both monumental and intimate and uh, Ivy loves it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, certain things maybe were done uh, without his knowledge because he died in 78 and the, the building was completed in 1979. But still, um, it's, it's, it's a sensitive uh, architectural work and um, the collaboration with nature is indeed a collaboration. And yet you have the assertion of architecture, of what is done by, by the human being, which is here. You see clearly, you know, these columns have the power of some archetypal columns by uh, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, for example. Uh, and so there is the sculpturalness of columns, but there is then the lyricism of these steps you know, where he's not, uh, you know, forcing the grass to avoid what he did. And look at the entrance door, you know, it's, it's, he's, he was a poet, it's clear. And look how he brings the water outside here, you know, look, I mean, this shows sophistication and also simplicity, you know, and it's unexpected, you know, I mean, if this thing would have gone straight, would have been too close to the column. So through these three, zig, through the zigzagging, it avoids getting too close to the column. Very nice. It's, it's creativity here. That's what it is. He didn't use a template, you know, uh, taken from I don't know what. Look at this. And he, yes, we know this by now. He was a lover of water and uh, you know very careful uh, about uh, not hiding you see he's uh, just like in an arab uh, or islamic uh, garden like i saw in Al alhambra beautiful sensitivity towards the thinnest uh, you know amount of, of of water here too we see carlos scarpa uh, inventing something for uh, for this water to uh, not, I mean, he could have brought it down into the earth, right? With a banal uh, vertical element. No, he wanted to bring it here in this uh, pond, you know, so to, he, he, he had uh, affection for this water. He didn't turn his back on this water. Bravo to him. I don't know if this interior uh, truly fully belongs to him and, uh, you know, things uh, change in time, especially the interior. Plus, you saw the building was finalized after he died. But uh, um, something of Carlos Scarpa is indeed here. I'm absolutely sure these columns could have been much narrower, right? With not with such a giant diameter. But again, architecture is not just about the measurable, it's also about the immeasurable. He wanted a certain atmosphere. He was counting on these voluminous columns for their emotional uh, impact. So again, not everything can be explained rationally or through dimensions. No. Architecture is an emotional art. It is supposed to, 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 to employ emotions. If it doesn't, it remains a building and the building is not yet architecture. Uh, by the way, for those of you who study in Bucharest, there is a beautiful, actually a beautiful Carlos Scarpa detail just around the corner of your school. I don't know if you noticed it. It's the entrance into that space that uh, prints, Canon is called, I think. So if you just go around the building and you look at the entrance, not the, the, the entrance for the public, but the entrance for the employees, you look uh, down and you see a beautiful 
uh, it was probably done by the, the architect who, who, who made the project, uh, uh, Hurduk. Uh, uh, I know he, he did that project, but there is a, a beautiful application of what uh, Carlos Scarpa um, taught us. Maybe a little bit too explicit, but I think it's, it's, it's very, very skillfully done. It's a genuine Carlos Scarpa in Bucharest, just around the corner of the school you study in. Take a look at it when, uh, when the pandemic allows you to. I'm still, as you can see, maybe I'm old fashioned. I'm still trapped in my house because of the pandemic. I didn't leave it in one year and a half. And, uh, you know, people are probably outside, the, you know, uh, enjoying the weather while I'm still uh, under the threat of a self-imposed um, exile. Well, only par in part self-exposed, uh, self uh, not exposed. Anyway, a look also at the uh, impose. Uh, look at the look at the flooring here. You know, uh, it's it's done with with sensitivity, with different materials, and uh, everything is a creation as it's supposed to be. It's a fine building, isn't it? Now, sometimes I joke, I tell the students, if the, the elevation of your building, especially the main elevation, doesn't come out well, no problem. Just allow the ivy to climb on the walls and it will take care of the building. I didn't yet see a building covered to an extent partially by ivy which would have deserved the word ugly no no uh, ivy can make uh, any building uh, at least acceptable and here in this case the marriage between architecture and uh, and the plant uh, is is, uh, is is magnificent I mean, really, what is the, the, the true significance of, uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can do a good building where you, you, you count on the participation of vegetation in a creative way, an unplanned way, and, uh, you know, the result could be very, very uh, uh, pleasant, like here. Well, the landscape here also is, is beautiful. Now, Casa Borgo in Vicenza. Beautiful Vicenza. This is an apartment building which I visited with students from Bucharest. Uh, um, and uh, um, unfortunately, I didn't include my own pictures here, but you can still, uh, uh, you can still uh, evaluate uh, the building. So it's an apartment building in the city dominated, of course, by Andrea Palladio. And, uh, and, and he didn't want to compete with Andrea Palladio and he chose correctly, wisely. But he created a building which is, uh, uh, has a genuine modernity and with uh, interesting uh, details, uh, as we would expect from Carlos Carpa. Look here, the two columns, the two beams, which meet here, and then there is the transitional element uh, between the column and the, and the beams. And here we have the two nests, T-W-O-N-E-S-S, -S, to use the linguistic exasperation of Peter Eisenman, because we have the two beams. He, he could have used just one, but right here where the column reaches towards the, 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 the beams, uh, he creates an event. And there is another one in the corner. Unfortunately, I don't have the best picture here, but I, I still have. Here there are some uh, uh, discrete, uh, you know, uh, homages, formal homages paid to Palladio and the, and the circular holes of his Basilica uh, Palladiana in, in Vicenza, a great building by Palladio. This building is not too far away from the railway station. So if, if the pandemic goes away, you might join these students. I imagine they are students here. There are too many around the building to be anything else, I imagine. Uh, and uh, yeah, isn't it beautiful, you know, to create an architecture in the city uh, in which uh, Palladio has many brilliant buildings, 
I mean, it's an honor, no? And and look look at the windows; they are vertical and narrow. He, he, he wouldn't buy the the horizontal uh, dogmatic uh, uh, windows of uh, of Le Corbusier. No, no, no. He he loved the vertical narrow windows, and, uh, and that's what we see here. Yes, he is a master of this, truly. I mean, even here, it's, it's, it's really about joining. Uh, it's about two entities coming together. You know, you have a column and a beam. You have a column and a beam. beam. And then there are like two couples, you know, coming together and creating this. Very nice. Uh, he, he has concrete, which is grayish, you know, whitish, and, and then the metal he paints in red. And it's appropriately so, because med, uh, metal is about metallurgy, it's about fire. So should it be, could it be uh, anything else but red? I'm not so sure. I mean, really with the simplest, well, not so simple, actually, but he, here he shows himself as an architect. You know, and he was indeed. He doesn't finish. You know, I mean, look, look at this. It's okay. I, I like the patina of, of of this building. You know, the elements working on the facade. It's fine. It's fine. Not everything has to be well. The interior is protected, as we can see, but uh, the exterior uh, communicates with the, with the elements explicitly. There is no shame in that, I, I would say, in as much as there is no shame in having white hair you now when you are older. Well, it's the passage of time. It's fine. Casa Romanelli. Uh, again, it's, it's a building which doesn't turn its back on what we call tradition. Water again in the proximity of the building. Now, Villa, this is a building that was uh, finalized uh, after his death by his son, who is also an architect. And uh, some of, of the Carlos Carpa uh, the aesthetics uh, are here. Uh, but I don't know exactly what the contribution was of his son. Still, uh, certain things uh, belong to the father, that is to Carlos Carpa. Uh, like here, for example, the paradigmatic uh, intertwining of two circles and uh, sees through water and the concrete. And uh, this is Carpa without question. And we are going to see the Brion Cemetery, which is um, uh, his masterpiece. Uh, uh, in, 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 a sure, in a few moments. Now here, I don't know, I'm not so sure. It's possible that um, his son also accepted himself with his own sensitivity, but it's still uh, very nice what we look at. This is a sophisticated architecture, you know, it's, it's an aristocratic architecture, if I can call it so, in, in the genuine sense of the word. Now, monuments. Uh, what the word monument uh, tries to describe is actually uh, a building, uh, a commemorative building uh, associated uh, plainly with death. And I think he was at his best 
uh, working, uh, in, in effect, uh, doing this presentation, I came to the conclusion that uh, Carlos Carpa was an architect who, and I expected this actually, but I had the proof because he did several. And in this, he was um, almost unique in the, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, he uh, understood that life is not only what we call life, but the human existence is also confronted with its limits, that is with death. So, uh, you know, he dedicated uh, some of his works to what is called the afterlife. Uh, and now a tomb uh, from 1940 uh, in Venice. Uh, he was very creative with these tombs, you know. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think uh, these days we neglect what might happen or what is described by the word afterlife. Very few architects uh, pay, uh, pay uh, you know, their due to, to, to the complexity of, of human existence. We are only concerned with life, what we call life. But what about when life ends? What about um, memory? What about, uh, you know, uh, domus eterna? In, in the case of Carlos Carpa, we see a clear, because there are five, six, seven projects that were built exactly for this, what is called Domus Eterna, the eternal home, a, a tomb, but it's done uh, creatively. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, if we look at this, what do we get? We get the, the, the message that uh, the architect felt that, that life is indeed transitory, uh, it's fragile, and we are all confronted with this fragility and better express it. And that's what he does here. It's a, a distorted cube, uh, hollowed inside, and, uh, and uh, you know, its dimensions uh, uh, give the impression of, of instability. But that instability is part of life. All of us are confronted with that instability. Good work. This is, uh, I don't know very well the, 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 the story, but uh, it's, it's commemorating, uh, you know, uh, fallen, uh, you know, soldiers probably. Uh, it's a sculpture. He only did a piedestal. Carlos Carpa. I love the, I, I like, I like the sculpture and uh, uh, the piedestal was not easy to do. Uh, this is what he did. By the way of piedestals, maybe it's worth uh, mentioning that um, Brincus, uh, Constantin Brincus paid a lot of attention to piedestals because a piedestal is something that makes the transition from the slab, from the floor or whatever it sits on uh, to the sculpture itself. So it, 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 it is not easy to do something like this because it cannot compete with the sculpture. Its role is only to sustain, to support the sculpture. And uh, uh, so it, it's in between um, the surface the sculpture sits on and the sculpture itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing to do a challenging one, but it, it, it's, it's important to do it properly. This is what uh, Scarpa did. Uh, in other words, here he only did this part to, to uh, sustain, uh, support um, the sculpture. Another tomb, 1960, uh, this one uh, horizontal, but you see elements of what I call instability here too. You know, there is... Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's done with a certain sensitivity that most uh, uh, tombs do not have. And everything is chosen, uh, you know, uh, aesthetically in a certain way, like uh, the kind of the font, the, 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 the lettering and so on. Even here, I wonder, was this done intentionally? Perhaps, you know? It was not done perfectly, but this bite of the concrete makes you reflect. 
because such biting takes place continuously in our lives sooner or later. And this collects, uh, I imagine, rainwater. And yeah, you know, these are these are important things. You know, it's it, you know, it's a surface one meter by two meters, but but he makes you think. He makes you stop. You know, and, and this is what architecture is supposed to do. Another tomb in Udine, 1960. This one, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, vertical uh, and it's. Uh, I think it's very nice. You know, it's modern. It's uh, it's abstract. It's minimalist, but it also has uh, touches of, uh, um, uh, you know, what I might call now improvising uh, aesthetical. Uh, uh, you know, sophistication. That's why I use the word uh, aristocratic. You know, I, I think there is a, this is a realm where the architect uh, could uh, accept himself and herself uh, uh, again with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with interest. Because I think when we are not indifferent about death, we are actually implicitly honoring life. In the hourglass of existence, life and death feed upon each other. And, you know, if you neglect death, you also neglect life, I, I would say. Uh, the two cups of the, the hourglass that I mentioned, they, they, they feed upon each other. Another tomb in Udine. This one a more uh, architectural, so to speak. Uh, it's almost it's a room, no, uh, an open air room, uh, but done creatively, you know, and uh, and rich. Uh, look at this uh, gate here, you know, and uh, yes, I mean. How are we to bring spirituality back to architecture if we neglect the afterlife? It's not easy. It's probably impossible. I mean, his most famous work, let's say it, it's the Brion Cemetery, which we are going to see next, which again, it's a cemetery. Another tomb in Venice, a little bit different. You see, he was not uh, he was not uh, in, uh, trapped by a single way of doing things. Like this is very different from the previous one. This reverence, this uh, deeply felt affection for uh, the human destiny in general and for the particularities of a certain death are, 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 are symptoms for, of, a, of, a, uh, of, of, a, of a cultured man who understood that uh, life uh, is uh, not to be lived frivolously. And, uh, you know, again, not too many architects today spend time, uh, you know, uh, doing something like this again. Do we know of such a work done by Ingels or even Rem Kolhas? Uh, no, no, they don't do. While here we already saw five or six, six works by Scarpa. Now, this is a, um, another contribution for the sculptor Augusto Murer uh, in Venice, and is right in front of, uh, of, of the, where the, the Venice uh, Biennial takes place. Uh, it's, a, it's a good work uh, by, by uh, Scarpa, and uh, I would say especially by the sculptor. Uh, it's, it's, again, an, a commemorative work for, to, for uh, fallen, uh, uh, fallen heroes. 
and, and, and look at this. So uh, what Scarpa did, uh, he just uh, uh, contributed with this, uh, this uh, geometrical uh, arrangement of uh, freely placed uh, cubes and the sculptor did this. So, you know, they both tell the same stories in a way, you know, is that the fragmentation that, that, uh, that uh, you know, death brings uh, upon us and then we see the fallen, uh, the fallen uh, human being. And so it's the artist and the architect working together. And if you visit the Venice Biennial, and in fact this year, uh, there will be, a, a, I mean, there is a, a, an architectural biennial uh, uh, active. This is right in front of the entrance of the Giardini uh, section of the biennial. I think the potential or potentialities of a commemorative architecture are always with us. We just have to uh, to pay attention to what is to be commemorated, because we cannot we cannot continue to live a happy-go-lucky life without reflecting on on the limits of life. And uh, uh, you know now uh, you know as we were affected by this pandemic, maybe even more so than at some other times. It's a great picture, you know. Uh, I mean, we have uh, geometry which is supposed to assure us that everything is right, but this geometry is, uh, you know. Uh, fragmented and uh, and uh, you know there are this there is a level of dispersion here and the sculptor very you know uh, emotionally shows the uh, you know the the fatality of, of, of death uh, now we arrive at perhaps his best known work and uh, maybe justifiably so because it is a masterpiece if we are to use this word. Uh, it was built four years, during four years. He died in 1978 in November. And uh, as I said, he is buried here in a vertical position somewhere. Uh, this is the uh, part of the plan. It's a private cemetery, you know, for a family. But everything here is a creation, everything. And everything is not a déjà vu. Everything is unique. There is the, the you know, the, the communal cemetery, and then there is this private cemetery, which is, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, out of this world, if we are to describe it with such uh, banal wording. Uh, you most surely know it. It was published, and it is published, uh, but it is one of the most important architectural works of the second half of the 20th century. And one can spend here time and reflect and meditate and write and think and draw and, you know, it's, it's a lyrical work and it's a philosophical work. I mentioned in my text, you know, the, the, the positive erosions. You see, this is uh, eroding the corner of the building. But I called it a positive erosion because, yes, it is an erosion, but it is a controlled erosion by the architect. And uh, uh, it's almost like the presence of absence. Something was taken away from here, but what was taken away from here is actually contributing to the fullness of the work. And you can see this hide and seek playing with these ziggurats that I mentioned in my, my, my text. You know, uh, everywhere there, there is this, uh, there are these uh, inversions, these small steps, these this, uh, architectural fragments that uh, have a meaning, you know, uh, they are about, about the uh, process we call life, about uh, um, ascending or descending, uh, they are about uh, movement, about becoming. And uh, again, we, there are very interesting things here happening. This, this man was also a great uh, architect of hinges. 
uh, you know, I mean, uh, I think he understood the mechanisms of, uh, of uh, which are usually hidden, of, of uh, you know, uh, that makes uh, that make a door move or a window move. Um, but it's clear that he didn't reject ornament. After all, these are ornamental. They don't have a prosaic function. No. It's an emotional function, an artistic function. It's a great work. I had, I had been here twice or three times. And uh, the first time I met uh, two young uh, architects from Australia, they came all the way from Australia in order to see the Brion Cemetery. I mean, what could be a better homage to one's work than to have two Australians come from so far away just to see that work, this work. Uh, but everything we see here is, uh, <clears throat> to speak, uh, you know, uh, measurably, uh, so to speak, uh, is uh, about death, no? It's a cemetery. But <laughs> paradoxically, this uh, private cemetery is actually enhancing life. We are talking about it right now, and it moves us with its beauty. You know, the bite of time or the bite of elements becomes ornamental. No, these are ornamental erosions, like here too. And look here, you know, if he was asked, what does this mean, sir? You know, maybe he would have said, I don't know. Or maybe he would have said, uh, I'm not going to tell you. We, we don't need to, to explain everything rationally, you know. The function of this is Ah, the function of that is mysterious. Okay, we we don't have to explain everything. It's like in love, you know, you don't explain everything. I imagine, I mean, looking at this picture and what's, because the architecture also goes underneath the level of the water. You know, there, there is also uh, architecture present here under the water. And, uh, you know, it makes me think that somehow um, uh, the great uh, Russian film director, Andrei Tarkovsky, uh, would have loved this, uh, uh, this um, work by Scarpa, in as much as probably Scarpa would have loved uh, the movies, the films of Andrei Tarkovsky, where water also is important. And I, if my text I read at first didn't uh, intrigue you or uh, made you desire to read Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, his name is written T-Z-U or T-Z-E. Maybe there are other, other ways of translating his name. Please read the Tao. It's a very small little book. Uh, it has only 80 sayings. It was difficult to translate because it's very, very poetical, but, the, but the, it's, 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 it's a thin little book. But there is so much wisdom there. It is unbelievable. And it, it talks about the, the power of water, the power of what is weak, what appears to be weak, because he said clearly, and I mentioned this in the text, water compared to the rock, appears to be very fragile and weak. But the truth is, water in time erodes the rock. And he gives other examples of the power of what is weak, like the blade of grass. He says, when the thunderbolt strikes, the, the oak succumbs, dies, but the blade of grass subsists. So there, there is power in what appears to be weak. If we can learn about the, 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 the power of what is fragile, we become wiser, I think.
Lao Tzu actually saved my life at one point in my life when my middle life crisis started. Uh, I discovered Lao Tzu and I have to tell you, then I began to paint watercolors with flowers on napkins. It was called fragility at power three. The medium was fragile watercolors. The paper was fragile napkins and the subject matter was fragile flowers. So fragility could have a power which the oak doesn't have. And look at these tombs, you know, they are also unstable. It's, it's, uh, it's really showing the, 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 the awareness of, of Carlos Scarpa that uh, we are all like this. I mean, our lives are unstable. There is instability. We only think we are like the oaks. But as Lao Tzu said, the oak, if the thunderbolt strikes, will die. So, you know, we are all fragile and the fragility should be uh, acknowledged. And I think uh, uh, that the, the consequence will be uh, um, not just uh, increased awareness, but, uh, but hopefully uh, an invitation to live more gently on this earth, to be kind to each other, to, to, to cultivate beauty, to learn and so on. It's a great work really here. It deserves a poem, not a prosaic uh, talk like I uh, attempt now. No, a poem. Because it's very poetical. Although the pragmatism, I would say, this is nonsense, you know, total nonsense, a waste of resources. <laughs> yes, that's what the pragmatist would say. But I don't trust that pragmatist. Now, if architecture is not poetry, then it doesn't deserve the name architecture. And look at the interior also. It's about eternity, no? But it's also about the transitoriness. I said this before and I will say it again, Charles Baudelaire, the great French poet, and there are 200 years since his birth this year, said that art has two halves. One half is about what is transitory, circumstantial, ephemeral. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. And, and the other half is about the permanent, the, the eternal, the immutable. And here we see the same things. This is a this is a fragile architecture about eternity in a way. And uh, you know everything approximates this kind of reading, you know, uh, or interpretation. You know, there is movement here, there is instability, but there is also the stability that the beauty brings in. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's both fragile and, uh, and uh, concerned with the, with, the, uh, with the eternal, because it is about Domus Eterna, is the house of, of the afterlife here. Uh, this image is taken from the communal uh, cemetery uh, with the entrance into the private one. Now, uh, this is another commemorative work. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a vertical architectural element that he erected uh, for, I don't know uh, what, what the commemoration was about. It's this thing that he built. And uh, um, you'll see some very recent pictures because you'll see people with masks, uh, um, you know, taking care of this. Uh, you see here, someone is cleaning up this, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this um, commemorative uh, uh, work of Carlos Carpa. And here they are with the social distancing and, 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 and with the masks. Uh, you know, some people still think this pandemic is a joke, that it doesn't exist. Uh, I just don't believe it, you know, when uh, three and a half million people died and there are still people who think the nurses and the doctors in hospitals are uh, playing a game by wearing a mask 24 hours a day, just like these people, right? 
uh, anyway. And the drawing, I don't know, I don't think this was done by Carlos Carpa, but uh, they, they, they try to restore or to clean up uh, his work. And here we see this person and it, it really moves me, you know, because maybe the pandemic made people, uh, um, um, you know, even more sensitive towards what actually death is. Because we are all confronted with the ephemerality of life. And uh, so, yes, in, uh, in Bologna, they found uh, resources and time to to take care of this work by Carlos Carpa at the time of the pandemic. Very nice. Another tomb, 1976, 1978. It was finalized in 1981, so three years after he died. Uh, and uh, well, I like to imagine that it was done uh, in accordance with, uh, with his drawings. But you, you already saw he did a number of works that, uh, that uh, essentially dealt with death. Museums. Now we'll look at, he also built uh, for this function several important works. Uh, first, uh, this, uh, I think this doesn't exist any longer. He built it in 1950, the pavilion of the book, Padiglione del Libro in Venezia, in Venice. Uh, he was a Venetian architect and very appreciated, and uh, he was uh, he did other works. You will see them all uh, for the Venice Biennial in architecture. So this is the pavilion of book, but I don't think it exists any longer uh, because I saw many, mainly pictures of the model and some black and white pictures, obviously from the past. But we'll see other structures and buildings he built uh, at the Giardini uh, section of the Venice Biennial. Now, uh, he also did that, I guess, is the, the place where you buy uh, tickets from, although I, I, I bought tickets from, but I saw something different. Maybe, I don't know where this is. I never saw it, but he built it in 1952, and I think it's still uh, functioning. An interesting, uh, you know, uh, canopy and a, an interesting uh, structure. Um, for some reason, I don't remember it, but, but here also we see uh, Carlos Carpa. Uh, we see how he divides this this thing. Why did he why did he cut this this ending uh, uh, in this way? It's 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 the same Carlos Carpa who saw both the flux and reflux of life, saw the the dualities of life, and that's what I see here as well. Uh, interesting uh, little piece. And I keep saying this, he understood that a column, when it reaches uh, the, the, towards the floor or here, you know, the, the earth, there is a transitional element, a third element, which is here, and the same at the top. You see, he is different. It is different. I mean, just this column, this, you know, you, he could have done it in a very utilitarian way. No, it's done with a lot of care and sophistication. Uh, lyricism even, you know, it's an event in itself, a modest event, but an event nevertheless. And it's just a place you buy tickets from, right? But as opposed to this, which is not architecture on the right, this is architecture. In fact, we see here what is architecture and what isn't. That's the difference between a mere building and something that transcends being a mere building and becoming architecture. Galleria d'Arte Moderna, this one, uh, I, I, I found some pictures, but there was nothing, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't find them inspiring, so I didn't include them in the presentation. Uh, this one also, um, I, sometimes his works are so subtle and, uh, you know, they have to do, I guess, with the atmosphere of the 
that he created an atmosphere within the gallery of the academy, but nothing truly to 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 you know to observe uh, easily uh, through a photograph. So that's why in this case uh, I, I didn't include photographs. Now Giardino delle Sculture, the Garden of Sculpture in Venice. This one is part of the campus of the of the site of the Venice Biennial at Giardini. It's it's not a big uh, uh, you know space, but this was uh, uh, fashioned uh, by by uh, by Carlo Scarpa, uh, and um, it's it's good to know when you visit the Venice Biennial, uh, you'll come across this, and you'll know that this was done by. Um, by Carlos Scarpa. Uh, he uses brick, he uses concrete, uh, and uh, the ivy is uh, joining him. Uh, and of course, there is a little bit of water even here. And then, you know, I think this is very beautiful because these uh, openings, as square as they are and black as they are, they, 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 they express the same awareness about the duality of life, in a way, you know, it's, it's, it, it expresses awareness that there is life and then there is death, there is fullness and there is emptiness. And, and uh, you know, with simple means, he's saying something, uh, I think. And it, it is impossible not to not to uh, uh, be aware of the fragility of life in a city like Venice, you know, because Venice is uh, is uh, in a way the uh, the miraculous uh, triumph of an uh, eternal fragility. It's a very fragile uh, city, and let's hope the tourists uh, will not think it more than uh, the climate change or who knows what the rising levels of the sea, the, the, the water is part of the being of Venice. You cannot conceive of Venice without water. For the better or the worse, the water is in, 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 intrinsically present in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the very uh, uh, life of Venetians and, 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 the, and the city itself. Even here we have dualities, you know, why did he do it here in this way and here this way? Even here we see that in between the vertical element and the horizontal one, there is uh, green, there is a vegetation. So it's all about really connecting entities that, that, uh, uh, cannot mimic that they are just a whole without uh, uh, interstitial spaces and uh, spaces as, of negotiation. You know, e e even this corner here is, I mean, these are subtle things that show that this man was thinking about everything, even in a simple context like, like this one, because it's not really very complex. Now, another uh, museum where you also see the, the eternal uh, obsession of the architect to bring the exterior in and to bring the interior out. And he does it in this way through these windows. And of course, the art is, uh, is uh, adding uh, what was missing otherwise. I mean, with, with such, uh, uh, you know, artifacts, uh, sculptures, uh, paintings and so on, you know, you you are you, you feel uh, inspired to to create uh, an ambiance that is concerned with beauty. Here we also see in the wall, uh, you know, uh, little squares uh, that uh, uh, seem to tell us something, and I try to approximate the possible meaning in what I said earlier. Look here, this uh, this window, and we are going to see other pictures of it. It's it's a simple architecture. It's not very, you know, uh, it's not a complicated architecture, but he he uh, uh, brings sensitivity to it in his own specific way. Um, again, just like uh, the Brion Cemetery, he why why does he do this? You know, it's 
I think the corner of the building is the most vulnerable part of the building. That's where the elements hit the most and the passage of time. And he seems to say, well, I anticipate this. You know, I know that the time will strike the hardest exactly in the corner. So I am, uh, I am, uh, I am, uh, uh, you know, uh, subversive in a way towards my own building in the corner. And I think it's a very wise and aesthetically pleasing way of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, showing awareness about uh, the elements, the passage of time and the erosions that come with them. Uh, here also, he breaks the corner just as Frank Lloyd Wright does, but in, through very different means. Um, I love this, uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, the, 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 the problems relating to the corner of architecture in general, the corners of a building uh, is, uh, is a, an interesting uh, matter. For example, at Exeter Library, uh, Louis Kahn uh, um, uh, treated the corners also uh, differently but but uh, but but he also showed concern about the corners. Um, I don't know if I have pictures here. I don't uh, here. This one do I do, and this is a very important work by him by him in Verona, uh, the Castel Vecchio, uh, 1957, 1964, and also in 1973. Uh, the whole. Uh, I found this, this is, does not belong to me. I found this um, phrase in Castelvecchio, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In other words, one plus one is greater than two. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit difficult to understand unless you visit it. I didn't visit it and I regret. But even from photographs, I can understand that a lot is going on here, especially at the entrance. In this miraculous space where there is this richness, you know, he was dealing with an, exi with an existing building. Look at here, you know, he is not afraid to assume the ruin, you know, the unfinished or the, you know, the, the, the broken, no. And then you have the, you know, maybe the triumphalism of a certain kind of equestrian uh, sculpture uh, or statue. But uh, the architecture is very, uh, uh, you know, surprising and uh, very interesting and perhaps not done with, uh, you know, uh, a lot of expenditure. I don't know. I don't know. But I like very much what I see here. You know, it's, 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 uh, uh, again, a commentary on life in a way, you know, it's, you can sit here or stand up and, and, and write something about uh, just what you look at here. Uh, it, it, because the building is, is showing its viscera, so to speak, it's opening up and it's, the interest takes place here. And it, it's a commentary about uh, transitoriness, about the ephemeral, about the art that we try to defend against the passage of time. So that's why we create museums. But, but the building, I mean, Le Corbusier was right when he said in the end, life is always right. So in the end, we must acknowledge that the box that we call the museum will and is itself vulnerable, just like this building shows here. I mean, look at this canopy, how, how fragmented is the, its perimeter line. It's not straight, it's not impertinent, it's not, uh, it's not showing, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, assured of its eternity. No, it's fragmented, but it's, anticip anticip it's a, an anticipation of of of, uh, of, uh, of 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 the in inevitable, actually, I like it very much. It's an excellent work, and I hope. Uh, sorry, um, I hope I have. So what we looked at was here. Otherwise, the building was not done by him, of course, nor the gardening. I imagine it was an existing building, but but his intervention is is complex and subtle and poetical. 
here there is also an intervention by him. Um, I don't know exactly, you know, where all his interventions were. Uh, here is, of course, uh, again, uh, Carlos Carpa, you can tell from, from, you know, and again, can we avoid the ornament? No, we can't. This is also ornamental work, is it not? He probably chose even the slight uh, differences in the coloring of these parts. And again, we have a geometry, we have little squares, but we also have the lyricism of the unexpected that, uh, that uh, is suggested here. His architecture is not an arrogant one. Although I have to say those three churches he worked on with an architect, with another architect, um, surprised me with, I see more gentleness and, uh, and subtlety here than in the works he did for uh, what is called uh, the sacred. Uh, maybe I should have included pictures of that, but uh, because I wasn't quite sure what his specific role was. In one project, he was considered as a consultant artistically, you know, speaking, uh, whatever that means, you know. It's an incredible richness here, you know, it's at the entrance, that, that part of the building that we looked at at, at first. Castel Vecchio. His interior design is very unassuming, you know, he, he understood here that that the role of these rooms is to display art as, as good as well as possible. And so, you know, he's discreet. He's not trying to, he has his drama at the beginning. I mean, at the entrance in the building, as we saw, but the rooms themselves, I, I didn't visit this, but I imagine it's a very pleasant uh, experience where the artworks are, are in, in, in the foreground and the room is just supporting them and nothing else. And look at the beauty of this picture. You know, it's, it's, it's poetry, you know, it's, it's delicate, it's subtle. It's, it's even these two lights there, you know, it, you could say it's not, not a big deal. Well, uh, it's done with a certain sensitivity. Now, the uh, uh, Padiglione de Venezuela is the pavilion of uh, Venezuela, which he built in 1954-1956. And we see again his uh, preoccupation with breaking the box through windows, which are done in a certain way. And these windows are also not banal at all. Venezuela, they were wise to commission uh, Carlos Carpa to build the pavilion. Yeah, but for me, the best pavilion, architecturally speaking, uh, in, uh, in uh, Giardini, uh, the Giardini section of the Venice Biennial is the one done by Alvar Alto. 
if you arrive there, where is the Finnish, Finnish pavilion? Very, very nice. Another great architect, of course, one of the best. No, this is in Palermo, but I uh, don't have pictures. Progetto per il Museo Picasso. I couldn't find it. I would have been very curious to see what he proposed for the Picasso Museum in Paris, but I couldn't find it. Maybe some of you might find it, uh, I hope. And if you do, please let me know. I am very curious what Carlos Carpa proposed. Uh, and now we go to public buildings. Well, no, the museums are also public, but that's how they were called on the Wikipedia, Wikipedia in Italian, which had much more uh, buildings by him than the, the English, uh, English one. This is a very important work by him, uh, Palazzo Querini Stampalia, or the foundation uh, from 1961-1963 in Venice. And uh, again, we see the water, you know, even entering the building. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a magical place, uh, very exquisitely done. Every detail is, is controlled. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I mean, look at these uh, cuts into the stone here. Why did, they, why, why did he do them in this way, you know? Uh, extremely aware of what is outside. It's again, it's about connecting. And even here, look at this handrail. It could have been continuous. No, no, it's not. This part, which is at an angle, connects with the horizontal one through this intermediate uh, third element. The same here, there is always a negotiation between two entities when they are to come together, always. Like here too. It's magnificent, no? I mean, it's a creation. Who would pay so much attention to something like this? Even here, you have two-ness and one-ness, and it, it, it's musical. It's, 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 uh, I think it's magical. It's magical because uh, here was a, an architect who did uh, have his eyes open towards life and his heart open, maybe uh, first his heart open to understand what life is about, perhaps. And, uh, and, and uh, the interior has, you'll see other pictures. Even here now, it's, it's, it's the one plus one, which makes more than two. It's, it's, it's a tango, a formal tango between two forms uh, that, that come together. And water is not seen as an adversary, but as a friend, is received with affection. And look at this. I mean, there is spirit here, you know. Why did he do this? Why did he do this? It's, it's a straight line, a break, a rift, which becomes ornamental. But, but it, it's, 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 I don't know, it's inspiring. I like it very much. And look at this part here, you know, another symphonic work, uh, of, uh, you know, a part of the building. And you see it here again. Again, here we see two walls that are fragmented, uh, eroded through geometry, but eroded and then meeting at the corner. But then you also have an opening, open, uh, enclosed, uh, open again. Uh, Uh, look here, again, three materials now, but uh, beautifully, uh, you know, contributing to a whole <clears throat> which is not uh, simplistic.
he brings architecture into the landscape, into the garden, but somehow he's also able to embrace, to receive the garden within his architecture and through what it means. Uh, uh, look here, I don't know, this seems to be a little bit bulky for my taste, but you'll see here the sophistication of this, you know, uh, leading the water to come into, into this receptacle, which is uh, receiving it gladly. Uh, look here, you know. Um, uh, as for this, I think Lao Tzu would have loved it. You know, it's, it's true, the picture is very nice, but also what the architect provided, you know. It's truly a celebration of life with simple means. That's what it is. That's what I see here. A beautiful celebration of life and of nature. Uh, Khan was right when he mentioned that uh, the detail in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Scarpa's work shows the adoration of nature. And here, you know, it's one wall and then the other wall and they distance themselves a little bit. One goes in one direction, the other one in the other direction. They, they actually distance themselves in order to allow for the water to emerge from here. A very little piece of water, so to speak, you know. It's a beautiful gesture of, of allowing water to uh, to, affect, to be affectionately received and acknowledged. Very, very nice. And now some plans, finally, since we are talking here about architecture. Well, you know, they, they, they are abstract, they are cold, they are gray, you know, they, but you see, here is the garden, here is the building, here are those steps that we looked at, here is the water going through, this is the bridge that, uh, that uh, we looked at, and uh, it's a beautiful bridge, and yes, it is in Venice. Where else could it be? Great work by Scarpa. Again, these, uh, these steps here, which seem to honor water, you know, they are uh, an homage from the architect and from the users of that space towards water. You know, water is welcomed in, inside the building. And now is, this is a picture, and I think this uh, part of my presentation ends here with this particular building. We saw this um, from a different angle. And now Banca Popolare Verona, he built a, a bank as well. In fact, he built two. Uh, and here he tried to bring architecture with a capital A to a prosaic function, uh, but the prosaic function had the money to, to pay for uh, the sophistications we look at here. Um, and uh, what can we say? Too bad it is a bank. That's what I would like to say. Uh, The two columns, you see here when I mentioned that, you know, the, he, he, he uh, uses a certain part of the, of the, uh, a certain kind of, 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 the, of, the, of the ceiling to receive the columns and also of the flooring. This is what I mean by the, the intermediate piece that uh, connects the vertical with the horizontal. Here it is. He didn't just, uh, you know, uh, using differently the, the, the slabs. No, the, the, there is this third element, the interstitial, the, the intermediary, which is important in his architecture. And look here, this, uh, you know, even a banal uh, radiator uh, seems, to, seems to have sculptural uh, quality somehow. Maybe unintentional, but... Uh, 
the interesting building, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly, you know, the envelope, it belongs to Scarpa, but then, uh, and it's so different from what is here above. And then the tensions between, you know, the, the uh, yes, the tension between the, the circles and what is behind, which is Cartesian, it's okay. Uh, we know this by now. This is Karpov, of course. Why did he create this? Why did he complicate himself? Well, because uh, beauty is capricious and it requires a little bit of effort. And so it becomes an event, now this opening. And also this, it's an event. La sede centrale della Banca Popolare di Verona, the popular bank or the public bank, or I don't know. Uh, and this is also magical, you know. I, I try to, to refer to this in what I wrote, you know, with the two columns coming together. We also saw it in that apartment building in, uh, in Vicenza. And then again, it's two, one, two. It's always a play between oneness and twoness. And it, it's, 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 it's again, it's about being and becoming. Now the Olivetti showroom in Venice, uh, Olivetti being the great manufacturer of, uh, of uh, typewriters. I don't know if they are still in business. They probably do something else. Now, of course, this typewriter here is uh, placed, uh, you know, rhetorically. I, I would have liked uh, this room to be without it, with all due respect to the typewriters. But uh, what can you do? They, they were the clients, right? So uh, Olivetti in Venice with the, <laughs> with the typewriters. That's what they were doing. Uh, and uh, here it is a picture without the, the, the typewriter. Maybe they sold it. Um, Venice. Uh, we see a San Marco, right? Uh, and uh, yes, Venice is magical and uh, not far away from San Marco uh, is uh, this uh, showroom by uh, Carlos Scarpa. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to think about these typewriters aligned as they are, but uh, anyway, uh, let's try to make abstraction of them, even of this one. And let's look at the, just uh, the stair uh, and the steps and um, Yes, water sometimes enters here too. And then we have again the, the capriciousness of the artist, of the architect. Why did he make this, uh, this shape? Why not? Uh, did he build for extraterrestrials? No, I don't think so. Or he did for those extraterrestrials, we are ourselves. I actually think we are the extraterrestrials, we the human beings. Beings. We are the extraterrestrials on this earth. Uh, okay, Olivetti, uh, beautiful uh, flooring and this detail is, is so nice that I, I had to use it for one of my my invitations. I really like it. It's 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 really it's art. It's art. It's like a Mark Rothko painting, or uh, it's it's it's. It has everything, you know, it has order, but also it's, it's the movement, a discrete movement. It's, it's very nice. I love it. And now the Gavina showroom in Bologna, uh, another showroom uh, for another company. Uh, look, look what he does here in the corner, you know, of the opening, you know, it's like he takes a bite of, of, of the opening, so to speak. Very interesting. He does this uh, other times as well. And uh, his uh, beloved intersection of two circles. I think we are approaching the, the very end of this presentation. And again, look at this. Maybe the very essence of, of Carlos Scarpa is right here. Uh... 
He was an artist, obviously. Thank you. And happy birthday, Carlos Carpa.